Hello, folks. My name is Tara Wheeler Van Vlack. I'm the CEO of Fizzmint, an HR automation company here in Seattle. I'm also one of the co-founders and a board member for Hack the People, the world's largest tech mentorship initiative. I take mentorship very seriously, and I've spent a large part of my career in tech working towards social justice issues and mentoring for diversity. By the time we're done today, I want you all to think of me as one of your mentors. I broadcast these Terra Talks every Wednesday at 3.30 p.m. Pacific, and you'll be able to find the videos on my YouTube channel. That is user slash Tara Wheeler Van Black. Today is... Oh. I've got a YouTube. Here we go. Fun. So today is, is your idea good enough to be a tech startup? Please go ahead and follow me on Twitter, and you can ask questions inside this Hangout if you wish. All right. Now I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes. You can see the little Q&A application in this Hangout, and you can use it to ask questions at any point from now on. You can also vote on the questions you want to see answered. All righty. Let us get started with, do you have a good idea or not? Okay, so question number one, is this your very first startup? If the answer is yes, then just go for it. Just absolutely go for it as fast as you can. You're not going to learn anything faster than if you try it on your own. So give it your best shot and see what happens. Here's what happens when you're trying to figure out if it's really going to work or not. So I'm going to talk about three things today. One is going to be your pain points. Two is going to be whether or not you've found a market inefficiency or not. And third is going to be the clarity of your ideas. So first of all, the pain point on both sides. If you're going to start a startup, you better be solving a problem. You better have found something that people care very deeply about. And when we use the term pain point when it comes to tech startups, what we're talking about is finding something that people care deeply about. Maybe they care about it personally, maybe in terms of a business. Maybe they care more or less about the, uh, the, the feelings that people get when they hear about their idea. Maybe they care just about the bottom line. But the truth is, unless you find something that people actually care about, you're not going to go very far. Now, when we talk about pain points, we're talking about them in opposition to something else. We're talking about them in opposition to the awesome factor that can often happen when people are really enthused about their tech startup and they don't necessarily realize that not everybody cares as much about their ideas as they do. So how can you know if you found an idea that other people are going to care about? Find something that has a pain point on both sides and that is your best question to ask. When we started Fizzment, which is, like I've mentioned, an HR automation company, we found that there was pain on both sides of the equation. Um, human resources professionals had to push paper instead of dealing with the people that they wanted to deal with. They had to do more processing of paperwork than ombuds work or conflict resolution or hiring and firing. And as a result, we found something that frustrated people that we were going to help serve. When it comes to the businesses who have to receive the product of HR, we found that businesses were uncomfortable, unhappy, and clueless about the, the level of engagement they'd have to go into to hire employees, to manage them, to handle just having employees around. So in a lot of ways, Fizzmint is really ideal for people who are just hiring their first employee. I could talk about this for quite some time. It's sort of my job on an everyday basis. But I'm actually going to talk about two other very good examples of finding pain points on both sides of the, the customer and producer equation. The second thing we could talk about is Uber. Now, what Uber figured out was that there was an inefficiency, that, uh, this, this problem on both sides of the equation they were looking at. One was Uber figured out that there were unused black cars just sitting around. If you'd ever booked a town car before Uber, perhaps to go to the airport or for a special evening, you figure out pretty quickly that people who were using those black cars, maybe there, there was a huge expense to use them. Just to book one town car for, say, an airport run or for um, a, a night on the town could be hundreds of dollars when you were only perhaps using that car for just a couple of minutes. So Uber figured out that there was a lot of spare time where someone was just sitting in one of those cars waiting. So that's a waste of time. Then they figured out that the pricing 
on black cars was far too high. And probably more than anything else, they figured out that people wanted an alternative to taxi cabs. There was, there was a market for some kind of transportation somewhere between the, the problematic customer service and unreliability of taxi cabs and the extreme expense of hiring something like a limousine for $500 to $1,000 a night. So as a result, Uber found this place where, where a lot of people who've used the Uber service, including me, trying to get back and forth from an airport, can't imagine ever calling a taxi cab again just because of the reliability of the service. So they found something that people really cared about on both sides and that it until we thought about losing it, we never really understood. And yet now it, it, would, it would suck to give up Uber. It's a great service that provides a lot of value. The second, the second company I was going to give an example about that found pain points on both sides is Airbnb. Airbnb is an application and a housing service. It's, it's like uh, shared housing. In multiple markets across the United States, you can find Airbnb housing. It's somebody who's got, for instance, a spare room, and they'll charge 20 30 bucks maybe for you to come and stay the night with them. Basically, you've got a roommate for a night, and, and that's sort of how the service bills itself. There are a lot of different experiences you can have with Airbnb, but they figured out that people traveling wanted something less expensive and perhaps a little bit more personal than hotels. They also figured out that there were a lot of people with spare room that they weren't using. So what you're seeing here again is someplace where a company figured out, or just the founders themselves figured out that there was a pain point on both sides. People were unhappy about their wasted space, and other people were unhappy that they had to spend too much to go to and visit another city. So now a lot of people who use the service can't imagine ever doing without it. That is when you know you found a pain point. The final part about finding that pain point is do you have a passion for solving this problem? Does it hurt you that it's not solved? I've personally experienced the problems that come from inefficient human resources and I know that a lot of other people have as well. I've personally experienced the situations that make companies like Uber and Airbnb work, and as a result, I think they've found a great place to be when it comes to people feeling about their idea. Second thing you can figure out in terms of your market inefficiency is whether or not well, you found one or not. Today's tea is actually this um, decaf cream. No, it's the Egyptian licorice tea. I found this at ShmooCon in Washington, D.C., and it is absolutely delicious. I heartily recommend it. It's the Yogi Tea. Go find it on Amazon. Mm. So the second part is market inefficiency. My academic work is in political economy, a lot of it. And as a result, I'm sort of trained to see when something is really inefficient. I can see when, when someone could solve something by pulling a middleman out of an equation somewhere or by doing something much more efficiently. Can you see that when you think about your idea? I mean, stop and think for a second about the idea that you have. Is it something that you not only personally care about in terms of that pain point, but you think actually fixes something. It may make something cheaper, not just in terms of money, but in terms of time or life, right? So we found a market inefficiency that was related to the expenditure of time related to the value you receive in onboarding, offboarding, and managing employees. Uber found a market inefficiency in the number of hours people were just sitting around in those black cars, not getting paid, or people paying too much for them. Airbnb found a market inefficiency in people having too much spare room and not enough money to pay their rent. So that's a market inefficiency. Did you find one of those? And so the second part is, did you have an epiphany? This is actually a really good way to tell if you are going to solve a real problem or not. Did you find something that that you just, a light bulb turned on in your head and you realized that there was something that that you just, you knew you could solve. People often say, five years ago I had this idea to, to make this cool gizmo and then somebody else did it and I'm so mad and they owe me royalties. Well, that feeling that you had five years ago probably should have turned into a tech startup because it means you had this, this, this concept in the back of your head where you said, this is an idea that I know is powerful and I know I can make it work. At least get it out there to people if you're not going to do anything with it. And Third and finally, did this come from an authentic personal experience or, or place inside you? People can tell when you're not being genuine. It would be very, very hard for me to sell HR automation if I didn't feel strongly that it not only needed to be done, but had personally experienced my life being wasted by it not having been done right. If your life's been wasted by something 
and you think you've got a solution to the issue, you've probably got a pretty good idea for a tech startup. Third and finally, let us talk about the clarity of your concept. So the clarity of your idea has to do with whether or not you can easily explain it to people. It, it goes to whether you can sell it, whether you can find capital for it, whether you can hire people for it. So that third and final point is very important. It's closely related to sales, but it also comes from a very genuine place. So <laughs> I knew I had a winner when I could tell my mom in one sentence exactly what I was going to do, and she understood me perfectly and thought it was a great idea. You probably have somebody in your life who despises computers or hates technology or doesn't understand the business elements of some of the things that you do. And yet, if you can tell them in one sentence what your idea is and they go, oh my God, why didn't anybody do this before? That's amazing. You probably also have a winner. That's a really good idea to, to, to get that response from somebody. See if you can get that. Can you put it on a business card? On the back of my business card, it says, where does it say this? An HR service as refreshing as it sounds. And that has to do with the fact that I want people to ask me about what FISMIT is, but also the notion of changing the way people have done HR before. Not just that it's automation, but I want to know what they think about our company. I want to know that. And you also want to know what people think. Can you get it on the back of a business card simply enough that people can say, oh, that seems pretty clear, but tell me more about this thing. Can you sell others on the idea that you, enough that you can make them want to work with you, to help with you, to, to, to help you, to be part of your company? If you don't, and this again comes from a very genuine place of, of personal understanding and responsibility, if you believe strongly in what you do and you've got a good idea, you will be able to convince other people that it's a good idea. If you can't convince one or two or three people to help you develop your product, maybe you need to refine it a little bit. And if you don't know exactly how to sell the product, again, go to some of those people that are less familiar with technology in your life because that'll be an excellent way to tell whether or not you can sell people that understand to the ground down what it's like to build a Python web application and still think you've got a really good idea. Sometimes mom doesn't tell you everything. And let's see here, point number four, tell me what problem you're solving. This problem, this clarity that you bring to the concept is, is huge. You have to be able to tell me, to tell other people, what is the problem that you're solving? I like to eliminate the word problem from my life as much as possible, except in this one sentence, all right? Talking about the problems. Here is the example sentence. We are solving wasted years of HR paper pushing by automating, onboarding, offboarding, and employee management through a simple web application. Just remember those three words, solving, by, and through. Here's what we're solving. Here is the, 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 the overall general concept. And here is the specific about how it is that we're solving the issue. We're solving by through this thing. That's how you make that sentence sound like you're solving a problem. Okay? Phrase it exactly like that. And the last part under clarity is, can you make money from the beginning? This is another one of those times where we talk about the, the weirdness sometimes of Silicon Valley and venture capital. A very good way to tell if your, if your startup is going to be successful is can you make money even with a very bare, spare product? Do you have a, a, a model to get paid, basically? Some of the most common ideas and, um, and, and perceptions from VCs, from venture capitalists, is that they want to see a subscription-based model or something where they're going to have some kind of guaranteed income for the company on a regular basis. So if you think you could get someone to pay for your solution to the problem that you see on a monthly or quarterly or daily basis, then you've probably got a reasonably decent idea. You've got a service that someone wants long-term as opposed to possibly just a one-time purchase. One-time purchases are not bad, but making money with a longer-term service as opposed to a one-time purchase is a way to, to ensure that you've got something that people really, really want. There are always accidents that happen. That guy that made the, the, the Flappy Birds, the, the iPhone application, and then he was selling 500,000 of them a day. I think he, he was Korean or Chinese. He pulled it because he couldn't handle how great his success was with one-time purchases. 
for this application. And it just looked like like a Mario Kart version of a little bird flying through Super Mario Brother tunnels. It was it's crazy, and yet people just adored it. For some, <laughs> I don't get it. I like the original Mario better. So you have to think about how your startup is going to make money. The major models, again, are subscription, one-time purchase, or some kind of associated costs related to your, your application or your solution or your company. The way that you handle those associated costs would be things that are on the ethical side, like uh, freemium kinds of applications or services where you don't charge for a very basic one, but you do charge for the more advanced version or the more fully featured version of your solution. If you do that, you may have some issues finding a proper price point. You will be challenged by people talking to you about your company to find out whether or not people need any more than the basic application. And if the people who find your premium product to be valuable will find it valuable enough to want to pay for it as opposed to just making do with the basic level one. You can hope that you can sell advertising dollars. Don't hope that you can sell advertising dollars. If you're founding another Facebook for, that's that's a common joke actually in the startup world, I'm founding Facebook for crocheters or I'm founding a, a Facebook or a Twitter or some kind of social network for, um, I don't know, uh, plastic spider enthusiasts or something along those lines. You're And, and saying that you're going to raise money via advertising, you're going to experience a lot of doubt and questions about whether or not you're able to make money based on that model. So do think hard from the very beginning about whether or not you can make money on a subscription basis for your application or your solution. As a side note, one of the reasons Liz and I founded the company that we did, why we started with HR automation, is because we were aware, um, as many of you are probably aware, that it's very difficult sometimes for women to get venture capital. Only 2% of all the venture capital that's available out there right now is being used for female-founded startups. So we knew that from the very beginning, we were just going to have to make money. We weren't going to be able to depend, although we may have conversations about this later, about uh, we wouldn't be able to depend on people just throwing cash at us, like is often the case in Silicon Valley. So think about these kinds of things in advance, and you'll find yourself more able to answer questions from people who want to see your startup succeed and are going to push you to make sure that it works. Alrighty, so that is the concept. Those are the three concepts that you need to really think about before you launch your startup. And if you've got those clear ideas, if you clearly understand the, the passion people will feel for your project, the market inefficiency that, you're, that you are solving, and the clarity of your idea when it comes to selling it to people, you are going to be in a great position to start a company. So absolutely, go for it. At this point, I can go ahead and take some questions. I always uncover this part of the Q&A and the Hangout. If anybody would like to ask questions, you are more than welcome to. I know we've got several different locations for people viewing today because I added the YouTube link today. Um, I also receive questions via Twitter and via email while I am talking to you folks. And I have gotten several in advance, and I'm going to work on those. Let us find out here. So first one is, okay. Okay, I love this one. People often wonder whether or not their idea is serious enough. So somebody just asked me, um, how do I know if my Etsy business is strong enough to turn into an actual startup? And I really like this question. It, it, um, it betrays maybe a little bit of the, the hesitance that people often have when it comes to starting a tech startup. They want to know if they're serious enough. I don't personally care if you're crocheting purple squid. I happen to like purple. In fact, I've got a purple octopus right up here. Somebody had a tech startup where they were providing manufacturing and the fulfillment of orders for crafters. And I thought it was a great idea. That's a solution to a market inefficiency. If your idea is just the manufacture of some kind of good and you can't move it away from yourself, if you're the only one who can do what it is that you do, maybe it's crochet or art or... Um, good examples might be individual web development as opposed to something that you want to build out into a tech startup. Maybe you don't have as much of a startup idea as you have a sole proprietorship, a, a, what they call a lifestyle business, something that anybody can pick up and then retire from but may not necessarily move further in terms of, of investment. So 
your Etsy business, depending on what it is that you provide, may solve something. You may be manufacturing a part, you may be creating a piece of beautiful art or technology that is something everybody wants. And if you do, then I am absolutely thrilled for you. Go right on ahead. Your business is serious enough. I'm catching a whiff of maybe this concern that people will laugh at you or not take you seriously. People take you a lot more seriously when you've made a, a serious business. If you can answer these questions honestly with yes, it's clear, yes, I'm solving a problem, and yes, people care about what it is that I'm doing, then I don't care what it is that you're creating on Etsy and want to sell. Go for it. Give it a shot and see what happens. All right. Next one. All right. <laughs> Sometimes the questions I get are a little funnier than others, and that one was an inappropriate one. I like it anyway. I'm going to drink a cup of tea. All right. The second question I have here is, and this is one I got in advance, and it's an important one. How do I know I'm personally ready to begin a tech startup? I am often sunny and optimistic. It's part of my job as the CEO of a tech startup. There's a lot of conversations about how people must be almost relentlessly optimistic when they do a tech startup. But I am that optimistic because I strongly believe in what it is that I'm doing. I don't know all the answers. I don't have them all. But I found a couple of good people that wanted to be part of this process with me. If you can't believe in yourself when you're starting a company, or maybe if it's just that you experience some doubts every once in a while, think about Think about how you're seen by other people. Sometimes we don't have the self-esteem that lets us see ourselves like other people see us. And you have more strength in you than you realize. You have more ability to do this than you really think you do. People can deal with an awful lot. And the only way to figure out if you're going to be personally ready, if your, your character is ready for something like this, is to give it a shot. I can't answer questions about your financial readiness. I can't tell you if your relationship will stand up to it. I have found profound strength and joy and support in my personal relationships and I am very grateful for them. If you can feel the same way, if you feel you've got solid support and you feel like you could take a shot at it and your question is more whether or not anybody will will like it or approve of it, just go back to these questions and then give it a shot. Don't let your own fear stop you from doing something amazing. And not just amazing, but something other people actually need. That they need, that they want, that they care about. Don't let your own querulousness about your prospects stop you from making something. Just try making something and see what happens. You're going to be stunned at the results 1% of the time. 10% of the time, it'll work pretty well. And 90% of the time is that 90% perspiration that Thomas Edison was always talking about. Give it a shot, and then you'll, find your, you'll figure it out. This is my third startup, and this is the one that's taking off. Sometimes they don't all work out, but I love this life. Alrighty, that ding was yet another question. Let us pull that up. Okay. And our next question is... I don't have time for a startup, but I want to be part of the startup world anyway. Um, how do I get involved in the startup world if I don't want to start it myself, but I want to be part of the startup world, I think is really kind of how the, the question is getting worded. Okay. How do you become part of the startup world if you just want to get a little experience, you want to dip your toe in? It depends on what your skill set is. If you are a technical person, as in have Python development experience, or you can create websites, or you can, you're a database administrator of any kind, uh, especially if you're a very new one, one of the quickest ways to get some startup experience is attend one of your local meetups and find people that want to work with you. It's going to be a lot more easy than you think it will be. People are always looking for others who can help solve their issues, who want to volunteer, and who want to be part of their companies. So I think you're going to have a lot more luck than you might think. All right. And the last part about whether or not you can get some experience without really, without starting it on your own is you're going to make some mistakes with this one and you might trust the wrong people at first. 
um, you're going to find people that don't really know what they're doing but have a, you know good intentions out on Craigslist saying I have a great idea and I just need somebody to build the website for me if you don't care and you just want some practice and something to throw on your resume you are very likely to not get anything out of that relationship but you might maybe try developing the website anyway and just see what happens um, one slight piece of advice get a good lawyer find somebody who can draw up a solid equal contract between you and your co-founder you might develop a great relationship but that is certainly one way to get a little experience in the startup world I would however hardly recommend meetups try like I've mentioned before your local hack the people the hack the people meetup group see what you can do about it okay uh, I have a question here from Robert let's scoot this over let's say you have mobile applications in production and you want to take it a step further how do you transition from just another guy with another app to a full-on tech startup making a lot of money I love it all right so one of the ways that you're going to transition from just another guy with another app is finding somebody who can help you market it probably the number one thing that just another guy with another app needs is someone who can repackage what it is that you're doing into a single sentence that people will care about if they care about it then you've got gold on your hands ask yourself also about the payment model one of the very first questions that you're gonna get asked by anybody who is involved in the startup world who's not a developer is what's your revenue model so ask yourself carefully what that is if your application is something that provides long-term service that there are associated benefits to having and that maybe has some kind of premium version you're gonna do a little bit better one strong thing I would recommend is find somebody who can evaluate your code and your product for you you need to get very good feedback if you've got good feedback then you're going to be able to develop your product more fully and I would say the final part of this is don't just find someone who can help package your product find someone who cares as much as you do about your product who wants to be your co-founder we need non-technical people in tech startups not only to tell us sometimes how the rest of the world thinks about the things that we make but also because it's very important to get the support of people who have a different viewpoint than you do when you're marketing a product that you both care about and on a couple of very practical elements I would say um, find a couple of companies or a few major consumers say someone with 10,000 Twitter followers and find a way to trade some kind of service with them so that you can get a review or a tweet or some way to get a couple more people signed up for your product offer some kind of side benefit to using your product at first perhaps only the first thousand people get to use your product for free that's often a very good way to make sure people will jump on board if you're confident about its its use and your abilities to make people happy that's a great way to get a user base you want to get good recommendations on the App Store and on iOS PS don't bother with Windows Phone yet but I hear they're making a little bit of a renaissance at the moment I only really know about the Google Play about Google Play and the App Store so those are probably the places to begin your choice as to whether or not to begin with Android or iOS is your own your real choice has to do with the ecosystem that you're in if mostly you know Java developers start in Android because those are the people you're going to be able to get to work with you in your company if mostly you know iOS people then start there start with an iOS app and then port it later that's probably the strongest idea I can give you in terms of mobile development and other than that oh, strong UX UI there's a mobile development conference happening this weekend in Seattle and there are always mobile development meetups that are happening get good feedback on it always be always iterating your product alrighty I think that is going to finish us off for questions for the day it was a real pleasure here again is what today was is your idea good enough to be a tech startup now next week is going to be I believe conflict-free salary negotiation I very much look forward to talking to you all and this is gonna be next Wednesday we're gonna probably have a special guest to do a rehearsal of how you can negotiate your salary with your next job offer alright thanks a bunch of folks we'll talk to you next week bye bye